America is a wonderful place. We always say we embrace failure, which is bullshit, but we tolerate it. And I've, you know, in, I've started, I think, eight businesses, and I'm kind of realistically three, three, and two. Uh, that's generous. But all you need is kind of one big win. I sold profit for 30 million. I sold my last company for 160. And all you need is a couple of those, and you're done. You're fine. One of the, the sayings I love is life isn't about what happens to you, it's about how you respond to what happens to you. And now a quick word from our sponsor, Element. Some of you may know I've been battling migraines for a while, and my doctor hadn't found any solutions for me. So I talked to a few of my pro athlete friends and their trainers who told me I was probably missing important electrolytes. I ordered some Element spelled with the four letters L-M-N-T, which has essentials like magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And over a 30 day period, I saw my headaches decrease by about half. I'm hooked, so I reached out to the folks at Element headquarters, and now we're working together to help more of you. Electrolyte deficiency or imbalance can cause headaches, cramps, fatigue, weakness. For those of you fasting meals or doing intermittent fasting, uh, electrolytes can make the difference between feeling great and feeling like garbage. You know, when you sweat, the primary electrolyte lost is sodium. Athletes can lose up to seven grams a day, and when sodium isn't replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps and fatigue. Anyway, I drink one pack mixed with my water before working out in the morning and one later after dinner to hydrate for the next day. Want to try a free sample? Go to drinkelement, that's drinklmnt.com forward slash Brian Elliott, B-R-Y-A-N-E-L-L-I-O-T-T, and they will send you all the flavors to try. Shipping is just five bucks. My personal favorite is the chocolate because I put it in my protein shake. I also love the orange salt. There's a new watermelon flavor to try. I'm excited for you to check it out. Anyway, get on it. Now back to our episode. My name is Scott Galloway, professor of marketing at NYU Stern, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Brand. I'm here with the incomparable Professor Galloway, Scott Galloway. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Brian. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? This job? So this job being uh, an academic? Well, you know, you have a wide body of work. You're a very yeah. eclectic man, uh, giving the most interesting man probably a run for his money, if I can say so. Uh, you got your fingers in lots of different soups. Break it down for us. Uh, sure. So I teach at NYU Stern School of Business, but I spent a lot of time on media. Um, I host a couple, well, four podcasts a week, um, Pivot and The Prop G Show. I write a lot, uh, three books, and I write a weekly newsletter, No Mercy, No Malice. And I spent a lot of time working with um, venture-backed companies and do, you know, probably spend about half my time either advising uh, or investing in companies. So uh, stay, stay fairly busy. But how did I get this job? Um, I've always wanted to teach. I initially thought I was going to get a PhD. I capita capitated it at an MBA. And but after 10 years in the private sector, um, returned or decided to pursue teaching and moved to New York and joined the faculty of NYU 20 years ago. Yeah. I'm always curious, too, about context. So let's roll back the clock a little bit and go to young Scott. What were you thinking about when you were a kid? What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, you know, Brian, I don't know about you. Where did you grow up? Los Angeles. I'm an L.A. Yeah, guy. me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Westwood. Um, I'm the uh, son of a single immigrant mother who lived and died a secretary. And I, I don't I don't say this is a humble brag. I would say I was remarkably unremarkable. I wasn't a good student, but I didn't test well either. But back then, when I applied to UCLA in the 80s, it was a 70 percent admissions rate. And I had to apply twice to get in. Uh, but really, the transformative thing in my life was one, you know, and most I think people feel this way that, you know, the irrational passion for my well-being and my mom and to big government, University of California, the generosity of California taxpayers and the vision of the Regency University of California. But UCLA for me and then Berkeley for grad school were transformative. Set you on a path. Um, and what were you, what did you major in? What was your study? I mean, it says in my, you know, it says in my BA economics, but it was mostly marijuana and sports. I, I don't, and maybe a little bit of a minor in Planet of the Apes. I, I, I didn't do a lot of studying undergrad. Um, you know, irresponsible, whatever it was. I just, I graduated from UCLA. This is no joke with a 2.27 GPA, which is not easy to do because that means you're on academic probation a lot. And if you're on academic probation too much, they kick you out. So 
Um, I wasn't, I, I did much better in grad school and I kind of got my act together, but I wasn't, I was a terrible student undergrad. I asked that with a little bit of context because I know that a fair amount of people who watch this show, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're in high school, actually. I've been surprised by the number of university teachers that have reached out to me and said, hey, we're showing this, you know, series to our students in high school. And I was blown away. Like, fantastic. That's great. You get to hear from, from Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher and Malcolm Gladwell and Seth Godin and, and all these other people in high school. I wish I would have had that. Um, and so I think it's great to hear you say that you basically were, you know, slacking off because... I think a lot of kids right now are really stressed out to have it are all following out. my footsteps. Well, they're, they're, I, I would <laughs> I would not recommend it as a strategy because the reality is things were a lot less competitive. You could get into UCLA with a, a mediocre G, uh, SAT and OK grades, and that's no longer true. Unfortunately, the world has shifted a great deal. Um, so it's, but yeah, I was, I was, rem like I said, remarkably unremarkable. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say that, yeah, true. It's true. You need a 4.9 GPA right now to, yeah. to graduate. But, um, I also think in the same breath, uh, students are really wound up tight. At least that's my impression. They're, they're very stressed out to have it all figured out in a hurry. And maybe we can, we can unpack that a little bit as we talk. But, um, I don't think that kids or students need to have it all figured out, whether it's high school students or college students immediately before they graduate because you know it's a big world out there and there's a lot to discover after graduation that's where all the magic starts to happen yeah i think that's right brian i, I would i mean it's there's some nuance there i i would think that you need to recognize there's different different on ramps to a rewarding professional life and also I th i'm a big fan of a gap year that if you're not sure where you want to go to school or you don't go into the school you want to go to that you should consider taking a year to work um, and what uh, the data shows is that the majority of kids who take a year, a gap year, end up going back to college, and they actually graduate in greater rates once they have that kind of year of additional season. I showed up, I showed up to UCLA 17 years old, and I really wasn't prepared for it. Just kind of, uh, not so much intellectually, but just emotionally, I, and I wasn't really responsible or mature enough for college at that point. Um, but what I would argue is you always need to have somewhat of a path and hold yourself. You know, there's no, you know, there's kind of, you'll find your way. I would say um, you want to make sure you have a plan. You want to be on getting certification or education or professional experience because time goes fast. And again, and this isn't aspirational, it's just super competitive out there. And especially um, there's what I would call a bit of a crisis with young men. And that is seven in 10 high school valedictorians are girls. There are now in universities in the U.S., it's 60 percent female, 40 percent male, which sounds bad, but it gets worse when you think about it. You show up freshman year at university, there's 50 percent more women, more prone to incarceration, more prone to opioid addiction, more prone to gambling problems. Uh, so I would argue relative to almost every other cohort in terms of the progress they've made the last 20 or 30 years, young males have actually made the least progress. And I think a lot about and coach a lot of young men because uh, I think a lot of them are struggling. I agree. I've seen the same thing. What do you think is one of the root causes? Uh, it's it's a variety of things. My colleague at um, NYU, Jonathan Haidt, wrote a uh, book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And he said it kind of comes down. There's He described specifically this epidemic and in depression among among young people. And he thinks it's driven by two things. And the first is uh, our fault as parents. I don't know. Do you have kids, Brian? I do have kids, yeah. And he said that our generation engages in concierge or bulldozer parenting where we use so many sanitary napkins on their, on their life, they don't develop their own immunities. They show up to college with sort of this princess in the peace syndrome and they get their heart broken or get their first C and they just freak, literally freak out. And the second is social media that, uh, especially among young girls, um, yeah, boys bully physically and verbally, girls bully relationally, and we put these nuclear weapons in their hands with this. I also think that um, more for young men, um, you know, they're not, I, I think they've been told a little bit that, that they're the, especially white men, that they're the oppressors. And I think the opportunities that uh, maybe you had and I had aren't as plentiful. It's much more difficult to get into a good school and it's much more expensive. So you're faced with, do I really want to saddle my family with this debt to go to kind of a tier two college? 
So I think it's difficult. And also, the bottom line is the world is more competitive. We had sort of a monopoly on a lot of industries when you and I were coming out of school, and that trickled down to more opportunity for men. Thirty, you know, a, a third of the population got eighty percent of the spoils, and so it was just it was just awesome to be a white dude in the eighties. And and you got free education, um, and you got opportunity to access free education with incredible admissions rates. So things, there's just no getting around it. Things have gotten more competitive. I think social media has levied tremendous damage on youth. Uh, and also some of it, it's warranted and overdue. If a young woman is, is, does better on the SAT and has better grades, she deserves to get into a better school. And we're also bringing more international students in, which is both good and bad. It's good for diversity, but also one of the dirty secrets of college is we bring in international students because they pay full freight. And uh, they're kind of our cash cow. We don't like to talk about it because it sounds xenophobic, but the reality is the majority of kids, international students, undergrad, not PhD, but undergrad, the thing they have in common is that their parents are rich. And I wonder if this, that in concert with this drunk intoxication around exclusivity where we brag about rejecting 90% of the applicants at universities like the one I work at NYU, I wonder if that in concert with legacies and wealthy people who can afford incredible tutors and the kind of industrial prep complex. The reality is there's just not a lot of room left for kind of average dudes. <laughs> and that's what I was. So I think it's a variety of factors. Yeah. Uh, so how do we solve it? What are some maybe like real tangible things that if you're watching this, you can implement either if you're a parent and you can help your kid uh, or you're a kid watching this, you're a student, what can you do? What are some of the solutions to that? Uh, again, I think it's multidimensional. I think we, um, you know, I'm a, I'll, I'll give my political leanings here. I'm a fan of the infrastructure package. I think uh, kids need, um, you know, poverty is a disease. And one in five households with children suffer from food insecurity. I just don't, I, to me, that seems unthinkable in what is supposed to be the wealthiest nation in the world. So this new rescue package is going to, they think, decrease child poverty by 60%. You're hungry. It's just hard to study. Your, your mom doesn't have any money. It's hard to have an iPad for remote learning. Um, so I think uh, uh, attacking poverty, childhood poverty, is really important. I think breaking up big tech, I think social media is radicalizing young men and depressing young girls. Um, I think creating more on-ramps to a great middle-class lifestyle that maybe don't involve a traditional Bachelor of Arts. You know, 50, 60 percent of kids aren't going to end up with a traditional four-year degree. Uh, making uh, the gestalt such that you're not a failure if you don't go to college, uh, more prevalent, uh, some more apprenticeship programs. So that's the macro. Um, How about if I'm the individual? What, what, what can I do to create change within myself? If I'm that guy, if I'm that ordinary yeah. guy, what can I do right now if I'm walking the campus of Chapman University or Long Beach State or, you know? Okay, uh, well, complicated question. So I think your job as a young person is to find something you're good at. I think that unfortunately we tell a lot of kids that you should find your passion. And, you know, I wanted to be an athlete when I was younger. And I was fortunate enough to not be a very good athlete. So that, that delusion was disavowed pretty quickly at UCLA where there were a lot of amazing athletes. Uh, but I think that we train kids on social media and your high school guidance counselor, or, or at least in college, that you can be anything. You, and if you don't have a fragrance named after you, you're not a senator, by the time you're 30, you feel as if you failed. So one, uh, I think follow your passion is terrible advice. I think you need to find something you're good at. And your job as a young person is to put yourself in a position where you can find something you're good at, expose yourself to a lot of different classes, a lot of different opportunities. And if you're good at something and then you commit to providing or investing the requisite thousands of hours and bullshit and perseverance and grit and grind to become great, it be, being great at anything, the accoutrements of being great, economic reward, camaraderie, prestige, relevance, will make you passionate about whatever it is. So I would argue your job as a young person is to find something you're good at, to say, what could I be top 1% at? Not to decide what I love, because that takes you to things like music, fashion, cooking, traditionally just acting, traditionally just terrible paying industries uh, that are very competitive and have anywhere between an 80 and 99% unemployment rate. So I think you want to find something you're good at. I think you want to be more of a stoic. Can I tell I you? I agree more about stoicism. I, I so want to hear ahead. about stoicism. Can I tell you a quick, quick, true story? So I'm in a Starbucks getting a coffee, whatever, uh, and I overhear in the Starbucks. Uh, there's a crowd of students. 
I think that they were high schoolers. I don't think they were college students. And I hear one of them say, so what do you want to do, you know, after graduation? And the kid says, no joke, I want to be an angel investor. And I'm like, I mean, great. What are you going to invest? How are you going to get to a point where you can invest something? Right. It's like assuming that you've already got this carte blanche, you know, huge bucket of, of money somewhere. And then you go. But I just thought that was funny, just the being out of touch and thinking about, you know, uh, the, the glamour of being an angel investor, but not understanding what it took to get to be an angel investor, uh, at least those who didn't have a trust fund or, you know, inherit it, whatever. So I thought that was funny. Yeah, that's a goal. That's that's tantamount to saying I want to be rich. That's great as a goal, but that's not what we asked you. Now, the question is, how are you going to get there? So um, I, I think I'm learning. I wish I would had the discipline to be more of a stoic at a younger age. And I do think there's an algebra of wealth. And it's one, find your talent, find what you're good at uh, Two, save more than you spend from every age. Just decide you're going to start saving money, compound interest. Time is the most powerful force in the universe. You know, we've heard you've all seen those things. If you put away 100 bucks a month now or 50, even 50 bucks a month at the age of some of your high school students, you're going to end up with a lot of money and time's going to go faster than you think. And sure, if you're a baller and end up going double platinum or being an investment banker, good for you. But assume that's not going to happen. And the best way to get rich is slowly. And also, I coach a lot of young men. And the first thing I do is I look at their screen time. I want to know if they're trading Bitcoin. Do not day trade. That may feel like you're investing in yourself. You're not. 85 to 95 percent of people who day trade lose money. Uh, how much time are you spending on porn? I'm not an anti-porn person, but, you know, are you spending hours doing that? Are you spending a lot of time on social media? And I would try and find areas of, of your most precious capital, and that's your time, your human capital. And I'd reallocate them to one, finding your talent focusing on relationships with people who are important to you. And also, I think physical fitness is a key component of success. I would start from a very early age incorporating sweat and exertion, run long distances, lift heavy weights, both mentally and physically, establish a level of grit. And also, stoicism is about not reacting emotionally, being willing to take slights without responding. And I think so, social... I was going to ask for you to Go clarify ahead. that a little bit, that, you know, uh, stoicism seems like... Uh, emotional intelligence or the ability to take a blow, you know, and not either get knocked out or react and, and rip someone's head off. hundred percent. And, and by the way, this is do as I say, not as I do. I'm trying to get better at this. I'm, I'm 56 and I still can't resist dunking on people when they say something stupid to me on Twitter. And what you realize is that you become where your attention is. If you're on Twitter or talking about Bitcoin, okay, you're becoming Bitcoin. If you're on a porn site, if you're on Facebook dunking on people or telling Democrats or Republicans they're idiots. That's what you become. And w our discourse has become so coarse that a stoic and I would say a warrior, warriors train and get really strong and they leave their swords in their sheath. They don't, it's quiet power. It's confidence and preparation and generosity. And if someone cuts you off on the highway, that's okay. You're going to be fine. You don't need to like get in front of them and cut them off. If someone says something disparaging or stupid about you or to you on Facebook or Instagram, try and demonstrate grace and either ignore it or just politely push back, whatever it might be. But that type of stoicism, saving more than you spend, having uh, controlling your emotions, don't, you know, don't give into impulse control. Try and screen out you know, everybody has a certain amount of externalities, whether it's sugars, we're all dependent upon something. But I like to look at every component of a young person's life and say, quite frankly, what would you be just less shitty at life if you reduce this, if you reduce your trans fats, if you reduce your anger, if you reduce your online trading, if you reduced whatever it might be, your time on Instagram. I, I could go on to TikTok for six hours right now. I love it. I absolutely love it. But I try and modulate it. I try and modulate Let's it. go back to investing for a little bit. I love that advice about no day trading because most people lose money. They're not that great. I think I remember, it could have been an Instagram post of yours. You were talking about your greatest wins in investment basically came from you forgetting about or not touching about stocks for like a decade. And those ended up being your biggest winners. Is that you? Your returns are... Your returns are entirely correlated to your time horizon around investing. Day traders, between 80 and 95% lose money. 
And it's all you'll hear about is selection bias. People will take pictures of their trade. Oh, I'm up 80% on Litecoin. Assume you're not that person. You just don't, it doesn't make for good Instagram to say slowly but surely on, on Coinbase, I've lost 70% of my inheritance from my grandmother from my college. That doesn't make for an Instagram post. And that's kind of what's happening across, I think, across America. And the bull market is wallpapering over a lot of this. But be clear, you're not, people say, well, I'm learning. Are you really learning? And by the way, day trading's fine if you get some dopa. I, I think, do, I love to gamble. I put on a kilt and a black blazer and I give myself a thousand bucks and I drink a shit ton and I love it. But that's consumption. That's dopa. It's not investing. And neither is day trading. So the company is how I've gotten economically secure is one, through my own businesses. But two, I've two thirds, maybe even 80, 70, 80 percent of my net worth has come from I bought Apple in 2008 and I forgot about it. I bought Amazon in 2009 and I forgot about it. I bought Nike in 2010 and I forgot about it. If you day trade, eight to nine out of 10 lose money. If you bought any five stocks in the S&P 500 and you held them for 20 years, no one has ever lost money in the history of the markets. So, you know, the bad, you know, I've got good news. I know how to get you rich. The bad news is the answer is slowly. And it's just time horizon is everything. It's the, it's the tortoise's race for sure. Um, have, have you figured out crypto yet? Are you dabbling? I, I heard you talk about not being able to figure it out and losing some money. And Yeah, I haven't figured it out. I'm a no coiner. I've never purchased a coin. I try it generally as a rule not to invest in things I don't understand. And I think I understand crypto better than 99% of people. Uh, and I still don't understand it. I don't want to invest in an asset where they can't find the founder. It's a mythological figure that invented this thing. So what I have done is I've invested and I'm going on the board of a company called Ledger and they have something called the Nano, which is a cold storage hardware wallet. It's because I want exposure to the space, but my strategy is to invest in the picks and the shovels, the infrastructure. Yeah, I have a suggestion for, for Pivot. You should have, uh, so I had Mike Novogratz, who's like one of the OGs of crypto, the crypto king. And, you know, by his explanation and him telling the story, it's very compelling, but I'm with you. I still, I don't get it. So... Uh, if I'm going to play with with uh, house money, you know, that's fine. But if I'm playing with my, my own money, I've got to be a little bit more, uh, I'm, I'm more risk averse. Let's switch gears a little bit to, um, you know, this show is called Behind the Brand. And we talk about brands a lot. Uh, I want to hear what the Scott Galloway brand is. But before we do that, let's zoom out a little bit. And let's define, in your opinion, what is a brand? A, br a brand is a collection of the perceptions and beliefs that surround a group of products or services. It can't be dropped on your toe. It exists in the hearts and minds of consumers. A BMW 750i is a 3,500-pound, or 750i is a 3,500 pound amalgam of plastic, glass, steel, uh, and electronics. Um, a BMW means youth, masculinity, and German. So layering on these intangible associations that creates trust, expectation, trial, margin, has generally been a fantastic way to build shareholder value. I would argue from 1945 to 1995, we're kind of in the brand age, the Don Draper age. But brand is essentially emotion and what you're supposed to feel when you see a logo or you hear someone's name or you see their image or you hear about, you know, you hear the tagline. It's, it's meant to evoke a set of emotions that result hopefully in margin. Mm -hmm. And so then what is the Scott Galloway brand? You know, that's a generous question. I have a difficult time with that. I think about my tombstone a lot, even though I want to be cremated, you know, and I'd like to think of myself as a generous person and a, and a, and a good dad, and I want to be known as a patriot. Um, uh, so those are kind of the three things I aspire to be. Um, uh, that's the, you know, I think everyone should have a code. I think it, uh, your question's the good one, Brian. I think everyone should try and distill down to kind of three words, the things you want to be known for when people think of your name or how you want to be, uh, perceived in the world. And I think it's also important to always have a big audacious goal, uh, professionally. I have two, I want to be the most influential thought leader in the history of business. And I want to create economic security for the people I work with. And those are both ambitious goals. I'm not there yet. But I think it's important to have, even if you change those goals, my goals would have been different 10 years ago, maybe even 30, and they would have been much different when I was a, a young person's age. You know, when I was young, I, I just generally wanted to be rich and I wanted to be awesome, right? I wanted to be a baller, for lack of a better term. I didn't know how I was gonna get there. I went into investment banking because I thought investment bankers are ballers. 
Yeah, but that was my total, you know, that was my universe right there. Yeah, and I'm guessing just using a little pop psychology, because uh, actually your background is relatable to me. I, uh, my mom was married three times before I was 16. I never had a dad in my life. Uh, on top of that, I'm adopted. I, f I finally found my biological parents uh, in my late 30s. But um, I, I am guessing, based on some pop psychology, that your desire to be rich had almost everything to do with the fact that your single mom struggled. You saw her maybe you know, toil and, and maybe not live the lifestyle that she wanted or you wanted. And, and you wanted to, whether it's called an overcorrect or a course correct, you wanted to do something different. You know, it's it's not um, it's not romantic. Uh, the 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 reasons why I was so focused on getting wealthy, but they involve women. The first is um, uh, my mom. When my mom got sick, I remember it was just me and her. And it sounds like you probably had to take a disproportionate or serve as a ballast in your household. But it was just me and my mom. And when my mom got cancer, it was uh, the healthcare was awful. And I remember feeling very. Um, you know, just kind of emasculated, like I wasn't a man because I couldn't take care of my mom. How old were you? That was when I was a junior in college. But I remember thinking, I remember thinking at that moment, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's whatever the fuck it takes. Uh, I don't ever want to be in a position where I can't take care of my mom. And then the second thing is, and it's not nearly as noble as much virtue signaling, as I noticed at a young age, the guys with money had a broader selection set of mates. <laughs> and... So it was my mom and strange women that initially gave me motivation to be relevant and economically secure. And those are, might be the wrong reasons, but I was very focused. I got very focused at a very young age on figuring out something that I liked and that I was going to be great at such that I could develop economic security. But, I, you know, I'm very people. I think young people talk a lot about following their passions and having balance in their lives. And my attitude is, look. America becomes more like becomes more American every day. And that means people with money have a better life and people without it have a worse life. And there's a hallmark cartoon of what satisfaction means in the United States. I think there's I think people who serve in the military, people who live modest lives can have very rewarding lives. The majority of people who subscribe to your magazine or watching the, this show are not one of those people. They're here because they want some level of economic security and they want to live the kind of the more traditional American dream. But for me, the, 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 the embers that burn were that financial insecurity growing up. I worry about my kids. I always say if I had what they have, I wouldn't have what I have because my kids just don't have that motivation. And I, it, it's something I worry about a lot. Yeah, I, I again, relatable. Uh, this scarcity and abundance mindset, I was definitely in the scarcity mindset when I was younger, and, and that was... I was on that same kind of path. Uh, so l maybe that's a good transition to, you've talked a lot about the disappearing middle class. What more can you say about that? Why, why is it disappearing? Uh, you sort of alluded to it just now, which is the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and then there's nothing left in the middle anymore. If you look at actual income, it's interesting. The poor and the middle class as a percentage of, of um, in terms of their income, have actually sort of held their own. The middle class has shrunk, but what you've seen is the 400 wealthiest Americans used to have wealth equivalent to 2.5% of the GDP. Now it's 20%. And 90% of the income gains over the last decade have gone to the top 1%. And by the way, I think rich people are important. I think people should be billionaires. Uh, they're more productive. And generally, generally speaking, I find this cartoon of rich people being mean people and burning dollar bills to light cigars. I generally find that's just not true, that on average, they are harder working. They, on average, they are more intelligent. And on average, they are more generous than the general population. But the level, the accretion of wealth has been so great that it can't help but draw some of the oxygen out of the room for the middle and lower classes. And there's got to be a balance. The middle class is a ballast to society. No society progresses without a robust middle class. China has added 750 million people, brought them out of poverty, and added a half a billion to the middle class. And that's why they are kind of become a superpower. So I think we have moral and economic reasons to make sort of a, a more of a balanced equation around the middle class moving forward. I'm going to toggle back to investing in a second. There's a thing going around, I'm sure you have heard of it, where people are essentially doing this drafting strategy and investing, watching people who seemingly know what they're doing. 
namely Nancy Pelosi. Have you heard of this, like Pelosi I drafting? I uh, mean, they're mimicking her portfolio. Yeah, they're they're literally watching her every single move or her husband's move, and they're whatever she buys, you know, they buy obviously not in in the quantity or the amount, but they're just literally drafting and do, and replicating, copycatting what she's doing, and and p- these people are having remarkable success, and you know, there's of course the conspiracy theorists who who will yeah. say. You know, she she has insider information, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is she's been extremely successful in her investments and her, her husband has been as well. I mean, they sort of invest together. But um, so you haven't heard of that? Well, look, it, there's a lot there. So first off, I mean, I personally believe no elected official. I think they should be have to put everything in a blind trust. They just have access. They're just privy to information around FDA approvals or whatever it is that they just shouldn't be able to trade stocks, in my view. Um, the second is I love the idea of investing in an index. I actually have an, there's, the people have like built anti-Galloway indices because I've been very critical of some VCs. So they cherry pick my losers and talk about my losses. I'm actually thinking of publishing my, all of my investments and having them audited. But I, in general, I think the learning there is, I think it's good. One of the keys to wealth is diversify, is diversification. And yeah, if you want to go to the Pelosi index or you want to do Chinese internet stocks, it's fine to go a little bit more subsector. But definitely don't do single stock investing and just be willing to hold on for a while. I think diversification, if you will, is your Kevlar. And that is, uh, you know, I bought a cent of stock when it was at $2.50 and I sold it for 40 cents. I bought Netflix at 12 bucks a share. It's now at 550, but I went to 10 bucks and I sold it. I've made some huge mistakes in investing. I mean, huge mistakes. I've taken bullets. But they hit my Kevlar because I was diversified. I also had Apple. I also had Amazon. You know, and the key is you don't need to be a hero. Put on a Kevlar vest, and the Kevlar is diversification. Don't put more than unless it's your own business, and then you might not have any choice. I've always had a lot of wealth tied up in the businesses I started, but diversification is your Kevlar. Yeah, and I was going to ask you. I'm glad that you mentioned it before I did. I was going to ask you why Jason Calcanis hates you. I mean, he's got your. I don't know. Do you know why? I'm not exaggerating. He spends an hour a day trolling me. Sketches, videos, um, follows me everywhere and says really awful things. And I, I at some point, at some point, it's like got to be flattering. But I don't know the guy. I don't know. I don't know what what, you know, what I did to piss him off. But I definitely did something to piss him off. Small dick. I don't know. Uh, I mean, he's, got, he's got issues. Uh, but it, it's always curious why they are. They're hunting you down. I mean, I mean, listen, everyone's got trolls, right? And you're out there, uh, not in a small voice. You're, you're making, you know, uh, audacious predictions and claims. And there's a little bit of fanfare and, you know, uh, celebrity maybe that maybe he envies. I don't know what it is, but it's it's. And I want to be clear, some of it's warranted. I've made some very provocative calls that have been wrong, and I I should expect and be subject to scrutiny. At some point, though, it just feels, I mean, at some point I'm expecting him to show up and profess his love for Jodie Foster and pull a gun. I mean, it's gotten kind of strange. Well, and, and that's why I actually like you. I'm a big fan because you are the first one to admit, you know, uh, your uh, erectile dysfunction or you're uh, losing your hair or you're uh, uh, having a midlife. It's a long list. <laughs> it's a lo- We're going to need a bigger boat, Brian. <laughs> I, and I love look, that's a good transition to metaphors and descriptive language. You're probably, you know, at the top of my list for coming up with these elaborate, uh, decorative metaphors, analogies, uh, and whatnot. Where do those come from? Are you shooting from the hip or you've got like a little black book full of them? Uh, edibles. I don't know. Where does any of this come from? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate, right? I, I, I got lucky early. I have people who love me. I'm economically secure so I can kind of say what I want. But it comes at a cost. I occasionally say something stupid. I offend people I don't mean to offend. Um, I, I don't do my, you know, I try, I think I do more research around business and stocks than most people, but occasionally I have a shitty take on something. You know, it's like I, the way I try and forgive myself is you're never going to be a great skier unless you wipe out a lot. You're not skiing hard enough. And I put, you know, like you, I try and put myself out there. I try and say what I believe, you know, and sometimes I step in it and that's okay. And if people call you out, that's okay. 
Yeah, uh, you know, so the, that's a that's a style, right? That's a style stylistic choice. That's right. Yeah, I love it. I want to talk a little bit about your books and themes from the book, but maybe let's do like an executive summary and talk about some of your what you would put you know in the Hall of Fame, like your greatest accomplishments, and then juxtaposed by some of your worst mistakes. And I, I, I set that question up with context because I'm, I'm curious to see what you're going to, you know, qualify as as a great accomplishment um, and maybe the lessons learned from these mistakes. I think, again, some of these young people are afraid to make mistakes and, and you're very open, you know, about being transparent and, you know, fail fast and get back on the horse, that kind of thing. So I'd love to hear your point of view about that. Um, you know, my, my professional stakes have been meaningful, but they haven't been profound. I started a company called Red Envelope. I kept doubling down, investing more money. And uh, 10 years later, it went Chapter 11. So I lost the majority of my net worth at the time. That was kind of devastating financially. Um, but that was probably my biggest professional mistake. But my biggest mistakes have been really personal. And that is, until I was uh, older in life, I didn't make really big investments in relationships. I I got married without thinking through what really that commitment would involve and ended up hurting someone I cared a great deal about. Um, you know, the, the personal mistakes have been the profound ones. And I wish I had just been smarter about investing in relationships. I kind of woke up at the age of 40 and just found myself totally alone. And to be honest, it was a concerted decision. I just wanted to be an island. Um, so those, the, you know, my biggest mistakes have been personal failures. The business mistakes, I've always been able to get off, dust off my pants and get, you know, kind of step back to the plate. I've never had a career ending injury. America is a wonderful place. We always say we embrace failure, which is bullshit, but we tolerate it. And I've, you know, in, I've started, I think, eight businesses and I'm kind of realistically three, three and two. Uh, that's generous. But all you need is kind of one big win. I sold profit for 30 million. I sold my last company for 160, and all you need is a couple of those, and you're done. You're fine. Uh, but I had failures along the way, but they were never like career-ending. They never the real the real failures were um, were um, uh, personal. And my biggest victories is um, uh, I've taught 5,500 students at Stern. I teach a course. I have an online ed startup called Section Four. I'll teach 14,000 kids. Uh, this year, I'm very proud of that. Tried to dramatically lower the cost of getting of accessing my class. The value proposition is 80% of my class at Stern, which costs $7,000 for $700. And I'm raising two what I think are secure, healthy, loving uh, boys. I think a man's responsibility is to provide economic security and to garner resources so that you can take care of others. So I'd like to think that I'm acting like a man. Um, yeah, but the things I look to for success and failures are, are personal. How did you turn the ship around after you crashed into the rocks? You know, well, a lot of that is America. America gives gives you second chances, but I never lost. I would say I would never lost my mojo. I have a lot of friends that, that have a failure. I'm talking about relationships, think, in, re in relationships. How did you? Oh, how, oh, in my relationships? How did you get healthy? Um, I, it's small investments. It's like there's an analogy to investing in the market. Uh, Ten bucks a day can be a million bucks if you start at a young age. A text message, a thank you note, having the confidence as a man, and we're not good at this, we express affection by giving each other a hard time. Oh, Brian, you're an idiot, or, you know, what a shithead you are, Brian. Rather than saying, calling and saying, wow, Brian, you're really an impressive man. I like your approach to work. We don't do that with each other. So small gestures, small investments, checking in on people, a little bit every day, just a little bit, and you wake up, and it's like compounding interest in the markets. You wake up with a great friendship, a great relationship with your sister. And then there's a lot of research that shows the biggest regret people have at the end of their lives. And my colleague at NYU, Adam Alter, did this research on, look, talked to people about palliative care, is they would wish they'd been less hard on themselves. So bringing forgiveness to yourself and to others is the key to having a healthy relationship with yourself. One of the, the sayings I love is life isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to what happens to you. So keep in mind, nothing's ever as good or as bad as it seems. 
And when you screw up, it's not entirely your fault. And on the flip side, recognize when you're killing it and you're doing great, you picked the right stock or you got promoted, that that's not entirely your fault either and try and have some humility. Well, now we just come back full circle. When I, when I was talking about the high school students worrying or college students worrying about having it all figured out you know, before they graduate. And that's, that's fantastic advice, which is, you know, uh, have, believe in yourself, but also invest in these relationships. Don't worry too much about too much. You know, not everything's your fault. <laughs> uh, some things are, you, you know, you have a certain amount of control in some things and then mostly no control in others. Uh, but all you can do is try and just be your best self a little bit better than you were uh, yesterday, today, and uh, and you move forward. Amen, brother. I like it. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from, and where I'm going.